All right, everyone, it's time for the occult, video number 268, The Coming Race According to Theosophy. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. If you read about theosophy, and especially if you read, like, Rudolf Steiner later sort of departs from mainline theosophy, becomes an anthroposophist. Uh, however, in his earlier works, Occult Significance of Blood, some of Blavatsky's writings, some of the writings by Besant and a few of these other authors, one of the recurring themes of theosophy is the basic premise that the reason there were different races is that there were these different epochs, these different periods, each with their own avatar, their own redeemer to advance mankind and, and help people become more enlightened than they had in the prior age. And the different races developed at different times through different methods. Um, you, you can believe whether this is historically accurate or not in the general sense. Uh, of course, I don't believe that there is an avatar, so to speak. <laughs> I believe there are individuals human beings who have achieved uh, mentally great things but i don't believe that there's a deity up there that's you know regularly spawning children or anything like that uh, I, uh, that's that's one aspect of theism that i do denounce uh, although i'm apotheistic yeah, there could be a god or you know cosmo cosmic force or something up there but i don't i don't think that it's really interested in fucking people uh, that's just my feeling uh, about it i know the, the mormons disagree with me with their elohim but according to theosophy the next race to arise, because there have been multiple races, the first two they are more, they don't really talk as much about them because they're like, well, they were basically cavemen, you know, the primitive <laughs> beings. Uh, I guess you could liken them to the hominids and then to archaic homo sapiens. Uh, and and then, then you have the three main races of the world. You have the white race, the black race, and the Asian race, according to the theosophists. Those are the classifications they give them. Now, there are problems with this in the genetic sense, but it's interesting we'll call it pseudo-history. The idea of the theosophist, though, is, is remarkably forward-thinking, and it sounds sort of like a Democratic Party manifest from the last couple of years, but their idea was that in the future, you'd have a sixth root race, and that root race would, would be spawned by the full amalgamation of all three other races, the, the ones extant in the world today. That when those people, white, black, and Asian, got together and blanded it up, when they mixed together, they would eventually form a new race. Now, of course, these different groups have already moved into the Americas and formed civic cultures. They've already spawned new linguistic systems. The idea was that when they formed a new race, it would be the sixth root race. It would become a founding race, and it would elevate mankind uh, and have its own avatar. That, that at, some, at some indeterminate point, uh, a member of that group comes forth, is particularly enlightened, and delivers to the world a new manifest that advances it beyond the old way. See, so they would say that some of the, the writings about early uh, 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 African religion, Egyptian appears to be the one most often mentioned, that's one epoch of advancement. So you have the spread of technology from Egypt and some of these other places in Africa. Then you get certain Asian groups, Hindus, uh, the Hindu civilization, the early wave, the Indus Valley. Um, they advance society. And then you have the Europeans, and specifically with like the rise of Greece and Athens and some of these others, they advance the race as well. And so you have these three points of societal and, and intellectual advancement. The idea was that the Americas would become the next, the fourth of the modern era and the sixth uh, in total, I believe it is. Um, it would come from the United States explicitly. And that it would result in the advancement of mankind to the next societal epoch. Now, whether you believe in this or not, most of you obviously don't, and, and I, I don't either, to be entirely frank, this does have a counterpart, interestingly enough, in mainline science, and that specifically in linguistic anthropology. If you look at certain tribes in the world today, for example, they don't have a, a word for blue. Uh, they would see it as just another shade of green, or they lack color uh, terms at all. This is a, a more famous example. And they simply refer to things as wet or dry, depending on whether they are, are more shiny or, or they look moist or, or reflect light more. And so they don't see color the same way as you or I. Someone that's colorblind has the same problem. The idea, therefore, in the cultural sense would be like when you get a cosmopolitan culture like Rome or the United States, when people are amalgamating different languages and different technologies and so forth, when those things are all amalgamated together, they tend to synthesize and elevate technology and, and society faster. They, they tend to create more cultural evolution at a much faster rate than a culture that is insular, one that has shut itself off from the world. We can see, we can see a counterpart 
with the Meiji Restoration in Japan, with the opening up of Japan to the outside world and reforms over time to eliminate the old feudal system, uh, to, to embrace uh, industry, to embrace trade and so forth, as opposed to being, as it had been for quite some time, extremely isolated to, to the point of, of mandating isolation. Uh, severest cultural isolation held Japan back. When they opened up, they advanced more rapidly than almost any other nation in the world and quickly became a major power, now a, a, uh, one of the most dominant economies in the entire world. In not that long, if you look at civilizational history, especially in the context of Japan, which has been a thing for a very, very long time, a very, very small fraction of that time since that period of opening up and expansion has led to some of the greatest gains the world's ever seen. The idea in theosophy is that this has a, that this, there's a racial component to the next period of world advancement. Instead of just opening up a country and it industrializes and advances, the idea is that the world becomes intellectually more powerful and more spiritually enlightened uh, when people, I guess, are, are combining their blood. In the, in the most literal Steiner-esque sense, uh, that that has purpose. In his positing, and this is semi-separate from their idea of root races and, and avatars and so forth, in his uh, theorem, in his postulate, he says that initially mankind, long, long ago, before, before people broke out of their different civilizational clusters and encountered one another and started having kids together, and this is slightly ahistorical. you got to understand that archaeology was still kind of, uh, you know, it wasn't as advanced as it is today. We know that the, the human timeline is drastically different than the one that we thought existed back when Rudolf Steiner was writing his works in the early 1900s. His postulation was that before people uh, blanded it up, that they could remember past events from before they were born as though they themselves had lived. That there was an unbroken chain of lineage going back tens of thousands of years, and because of its unbrokenness, the similarity of blood allowed people certain powers, in the literal sense. Certain psychic abilities uh, were, were mentioned, and the ability of racial memory, that is, that you could live your ancestors' experience as though it was actually yours, because of that unbroken chain, I guess the idea was that the incarnation cycle was continuous and linked at that point, and so there was nothing to break it in the mental sense. When people began to mix it up, they lost the racial memory, ah, but they gained the ability of seeing the world in a different way. They gained the ability to, to see it in more logical uh, aspects. Uh, technology starts to take off, and it was seen as positive, and also it gave them the ability to become enlightened. The idea was that before they really couldn't do that because, of course, you've got that unbroken chain. They're not really kind of sort of an individual entity. They're part of that unbroken lineage until they begin to, to stretch forth their, their blood lineage. It gets a little confusing. And again, I don't happen to agree with all of this. Of course, we know the aspects of science that the theosophists were basing their beliefs off of back then have been discredited. It's sort of like Marx. Marx thought that primitive man was communistic. And so he said, well, it's natural. We're just returning to our roots. Well, of course, we know that's not the case. If you look at the earliest human civilizations, you look at Hoyek, was 9,000 years ago, people were already diverging their structures away from one another and organizing around a family structure, not in a communal structure. The only thing communal about it was that it had an exterior wall and walkways so that people could move around more easily, it had a semi-adequate road system and this giant honeycomb structure. Um, you look at Gobekli Tepe, even older. The level of organization there uh, denounces the very existence of, of a communal structure. It would have been impossible for a bunch of communalists simply sharing things to have justified the labor involved. And so it's been completely discredited, which is a reason that communism will never work. Despite the fact that you can therefore sort of erode the underpinnings of this theory, it is still of interest. And I figured people might be interested. You should definitely take a look at Steiner's Occult Significance of Blood. Uh, available, by the way, on Amazon, edited by yours truly. Uh, it is a really good work, and that's only one of the things that it touches on as well. That's about all. Peace out.